Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you for coming. We've got a big crowd here tonight at the Carnegie Museum. We're delighted to have all of you take part in a celebration of the farms that have been around in Jefferson County for the longest time, maintained by individual families. The heritage farms in the state of Iowa are honored for having 150 years, a century and a half at a minimum, of continuous ownership and, and use by, by one family. And so tonight, you can see from the green shirts, we have the DeVores. So let's welcome them. As part of this event, uh, this is our third of, uh, we hope, 14, because in, in Jefferson County, there are 14 family farms that have been operating for over a century and a half. And we have many more, over 50 more, uh, that have been in continuous operation for a century. And the century farms will also celebrate a few months down the line. One, one family per month is given the opportunity here at, at Carnegie Museum on the third floor to have a display case and to show their family story. And this is part of that occasion where we tell their family story and hear about it. So we're delighted. Uh, if you'll, We're going to go down the line here and we'll introduce the person to our left. This is Ryan DeVore, <coughs> who's currently farming out on the, the family property, which has been since 1864. Uh, a farm for the DeVore family. And Ryan, to your left. And this is Marion DeVore, my grandma. Ryan's grandmother. And when did you, I don't mean to ask We them. We purchased the farm from uh, my husband Carol's dad, Guy Roy DeVore, in 1966 or 7, somewhere in there. <coughs> and moved out there shortly after that. My daughter Sarah <coughs> is named for both her grandmothers and <coughs> excuse me and uh, she started kindergarten in Fairfield uh, when we moved to the farm. Summer 67. Okay now previously I saw some pictures upstairs in, in the display. I know that uh, Locust Grove school, the one-room schoolhouse, that, which is no longer, uh, was where some of your uh, family members went. Who were they? That would be my husband and his sister. Now, I did see, and people who visit the museum are going to get a chance to see a desk taken from that school with some interesting carvings in it. Uh, would you be willing to, to talk about that? Uh, my husband carved his name, and it, it would have probably been around second or third grade, probably the size of the desk and <coughs> excuse me so about 19 29 or 1936 oh, 36 i would guess well, well he was no no that would have been about 1930 or yeah. 31 yes yes and uh well, he carved names. his name in there and then his younger sister came to, to the same school in the country and she carved her name over the top of his. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be outdone, the little sister. And so it's See, up there for people to enjoy seeing. We'll and we bought the the desk desk at uh, probably the sale whenever they sell, sold the schoolhouse. The schoolhouse is still there. It's not in very good condition. Once upon a time, there were 99 one-room schoolhouses in this county alone. And it's always been fun to find out where the families uh, did go to school and then when they did come into town to go to school. So as I understand it, both of you have always been coming to the Fairfield schools. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, uh, you graduated what year? From 2000. The year 2000 from Fairfield High School. Okay. When did you move out to the property? Um, pretty much all my life, my, my dad lived on it, and then I purchased a portion and built my house on it. So right. I've been there my whole life. All right. I do always ask, and I hope no one's ever uh, uncomfortable at the notion, what happened at various stages uh, in Iowa's history? Um, when did electricity come to the farm, according to the family stories? My husband said that they put it in as soon as the REC uh, was able to do would have been late 30s or early 40s and the electricity was just uh, ceiling fixtures and uh, 
one plug-in in each room halfway down the wall so that they didn't have to use so much wiring. <laughs> this REC that you're referring to, if it's okay for me to explain, is the Rural Electrification uh, Commission that was set up by Congress in 1936. Many family farms in Iowa did not get uh, electrified until after World War II because of the shortage of copper. And so it is uh, actually a good sign. You're, you were way out ahead in that respect, though it was, as you're describing, a bare bones uh, operation to have only a few fixtures and only in a certain place. But that is, uh, that is a real early for electrification. Um, some of the stories I would mentioned and, and uh, back in the day when electrification came to each farm, it was often the first purchase after that happened was for the family to run to town and get jello. Some, and the reason for it, who knows who's ever made jello? Must it be a constant cool but not cold temperature? Constant. It'll never it won't be jello unless it's the same steady temperature. We know that the ice boxes that have been around forever and ever are really cold, too cold in a way, and then too warm to have jello work. So that was often the first celebration to get jello. <laughs> um, another thing we'll ask about, and we always do, and you'll, you'll see it on, uh, at the exhibit upstairs, what color is the family tractor? Orange. Yeah, orange. orange. <laughs> Signifying for the people who would don't know. Alice Chalmers. Alice Chalmers. Okay, we always ask if you're green, red, <laughs> orange. And then as far as uh, hawks or cyclones? No. Hawkeyes. Okay. Both. Well, I'm a Hawkeye graduate. <laughs> okay, well then you have every, every good And reason. both because I, grew, I, I graduated from high school eight miles from Ames, so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we I like both. We accept the sending voices here. <laughs> That's good. And it is true in every family. Is, is there a mailbox that shows it too? Um, no. no. Okay. All right. Some are pretty straight out there, and I'll tell you if you're delivering mail here, just you should know this is a Hawkeye. I do have a grandson named Kenny. Ah. <laughs> oh yeah. Grandson. Great. My great well, her great grandson. Oh, He's not here. He lives okay, in great. Davenport. Great. Okay. That's where I was born in Davenport. So. Uh, if you're named Kinnick, you know that you're a hawk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, people look back um, at the 240 acres. It's been subdivided in vari at various times. How did it work out? The, the story behind the people sitting here, all the way back to 1864, goes back to three brothers, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. Saw a picture of them. I t heard that they had a push cart and their own legs. I don't know about that. Somebody heard that story probably that's from true. my husband, yeah, but I, that I'm not familiar with. They walked all the way here on it's a push cart. I'm, I'm assuming it was like a Mormon hand cart. Mm -hmm. It's like the great big wheels, like four mm -hmm. feet tall, and, and they put everything they own in that one cart and came here and purchased. From where? They Ohio, orig or well, they the originated in uh, one line of divorce two lines of divorce married one line came from washington county pennsylvania and one line came from washington county new york mm -hmm. surprisingly that i did that research uh probably 40 years ago and i don't remember all the details but then they came here from cardington and ohio. then they came here from cardington ohio yes ma'am well that's a heck of a walk <laughs> <laughs> and we have to give them credit for that we we I'm Swedish, and our family came, got as far as Chicago via the Great Lakes, and then walked 150 miles or thereabouts to around Galesburg and farmed there. That's not anywhere near as far as, as those brothers walked. And then they found the land here. They, it's 240 acres, um, and they stayed. And uh, you folks are here. Locust, do we, do we know that we all have, we have 12 townships in our county. And if, let's maybe tilt the map up, and Jason, you can have a look at it. If you can point, Ryan, where your farm's located. Uh, Locust Grove is here, and um, we are up about here in Section 20. And 17. And 17. And Cedar Thanks. Creek runs right through, pretty much splits the property in half. 
And Cedar Creek, we know, runs real close here to where we are. And it's a place that people who hunt back for ancient history have a field day. And I know Ryan's among the people that have found amazing things, some of which are up in the display case. Would you mind talking about your, it seems like a hobby. Yeah, we're talking about arrowheads and pottery. I've, I don't find a lot on the farm, but maybe once a year I'll find one, just run across it. So, and they're pretty old compared to how long we've been there, so. How far back are you? Well, most of ours, probably, the ones we found, they're maybe 3,000, up to 3,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And there's there's older around. But. So for a country that is only a tenth, not even quite a tenth as long as that, that's really far back in time. What this about the one big, big artifact? My dad, I grew up, my dad always telling us that the big rock was oh, right yeah. by the glacier. Yeah, we have a lot of the uh, geology I'm, we're kind of interested in, too, is we have a big rock in the timber. It's as big as a car, and it just sits on a hillside. It's kind of a local landmark, I guess. So, so it wasn't ground to a pulp by the, yeah. by the glaciers. So it would have been a, a dropping from the glaciers. Yes, mm -hmm. It's widely known that the glaciers pretty much stopped, that we're kind of on the borderline, mm -hmm. you know, maybe as far north as Des Moines. Where it, and of course, we've been to Dubuque to realize things change as you come south from there. We were spared some of the glacial grinding that mm -hmm. went on. And in other cases, a few escaped. So that, that rock is mm -hmm. going to be with. Um, are there stories about that you've been able to put together or about the rock? Mm -hmm. Um, no, that one, I did metal detect around it once and I found some unusual stuff like just some trash and looked like maybe somebody had a fire at one time. So I think it was just always a local place to hang out maybe or something. I didn't find anything real neat but just trash. And there's another story of another rock that Grandpa told me that's on the south side of the creek. It was in a field and way back in the day they they buried it under under a terrace with a team of 16 horses and the, the bottom plows. Wow. So that was kind of neat. And I've never really located that rock. It's, so it's buried, still, but... Still out there. What was the reason given for trying to... Just get, more farmland. I get it out of the way of the, yeah. of the farm. That's an amazing story. Um, we've heard stories of people that would ice skate to school back in the day. <laughs> Are there any family stories about how they got around and any severe weather memories uh, up, to, up to? My grandpa had a uh, one, like a kind of a disease where one leg was longer than the other. He had a trouble walking around when he was a kid. And I remember him saying he got a ride to school on a horse. One of the other neighbors would pick him up along the way once in a while. That's great. Now, I understand there Schools are strict and, and the upbringing was strict and I think you know what I'm going to be talking about. Up in the display case, there's a, uh, well, it's a razor strap you sharpen a razor, razor on. strap. But it was a dual purpose uh, <laughs> strap. And what is the story behind that dual purpose strap? Uh, I had, my husband told me the story that uh, his dad used that and probably his dad before that, and uh, but he used it for more than one purpose. He used he he shaved with a straight razor, but it was also used for spanking children. But and he says it wasn't, it didn't hurt as bad as uh, a, a switch. The little switch is that's right. The other thing was the painful. Nonetheless, that was an impressive. If you see the, the display, you realize it was a good idea not to have to have it be brought your way. There's some other real fascinating things up there. There are skulls. It looked like a cow. Uh, yeah, this is a cow skull I think I found when I was a child, and we've always had cows as far as I can remember. The house on the property built in, in 1904 was the one Grandma lives in. Great. Mine was built in 2010, and uh, Lois is in 82, 1982, the year you were born. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, is there a next gen? Is there, we've got, do we have, are we looking at the next we generation? Have Roscoe and Arlo, and 
Guys, you got to come up and get on camera. Come on. Okay. Roscoe, Ross, Harley, and Alex. Harley and Alex. Here, here stand in front. Place. They're the ones that live. Okay. They're the ones that live on the farm. Okay. Come on up. You can get your. Come on up. All right. You can well, stand. We're not going to make you give a speech, boys. Yeah. But we'd like to know what it's like to live out on the farm. Do you like it? And what do you like about it? Um, mainly having the giant land to ride forwards on and do fun stuff. Do you spend much time at Cedar Creek? Not often, but we go there sometimes. My favorite part about going, about having a lucky area to ride things is because I can ride my bike mm -hmm. and I can do really what good. <laughs> <laughs> Try to do really good, really. There's some good uh, holes here I can pull up and, and Awesome. And Straight up? <laughs> and, and I can do a lot of other. How about winter? Do you skate out there or do you do a lot of. Um, I, did, I like to do snowball fights. Look at this camera, uh, Harley. Look at the camera. You can tell the man. Oh, so the snowball fights are fun? Yep. Yeah. To um, let let our, Roscoe talk. Our wetlands freeze up, and when there's water in it, we grab our four and ride I on the ice. I can't hear you. On the ice? Yeah. Speak up. Speak up a little bit, Roscoe. It's crazy. Squash. He's the hunter, too, isn't he? Well, tell him about, tell him about you, ice skating. When they boys, get that. if you had your fa absolute favorite thing you like to do out the farm, what might it be? Each one. Well, what about Might. that deer stand last year? Mm -hmm. What do you What do you do for our family last year? Um, getting my family the food we need by hunting deer, getting two does and a buck, nice eight pointer. It's probably the best thing on the farm. All right. And other guys, what are you, What are yours? <laughs> probably a four wheeler for you. Yeah. Something to do with that. Kayaking. What was your question again? What was your favorite thing your to do on the farm? Thing to do at the farm. You kayak out there? Yeah. Do yeah. yeah. in the yeah. back field with my dad when we have to go do stuff in the back field? So the way it's set up, there's fields. It's all all CRP now, it's all, um, and some pasture and it's just. Four wheeler tracks. Lots of four wheeler trails. Sure, yeah. that's that's kind of one of the pastimes we enjoy. We have some four wheeler track at all house. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. And, and what do you grow some... on your farm? Uh, we usually just grow tomatoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and chickens. <laughs> and, chickens now. And we have some chickens, so oh, we have to take care of chickens. Oh, and we yeah. had a spot that we could grow whatever. Mm -hmm. A lot of things. But we have a lot of we weeds. We have to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have some uh, meat chickens that we have to take care of, and some egg layers. One of the egg layers died in most, <laughs> most of the meat. Very good. But there's still plenty. Now, overall, as far as the farm goes officially, so is it all? Uh, is there any livestock? Um, not currently, other than some chickens. Okay. When, when my husband got uh, so that he couldn't. Uh, manage things anymore. All the time that we've lived there, my husband worked in a factory here in Fairfield okay. at Dexter for 38 years. Yes, ma'am. And he was oh, somewhat disabled. He had three inch uh, difference in his leg length uh, due to osteomyelitis as a child. And uh, so I lost my train of thought. We kind of <laughs> retired the cattle. Yeah, business. yeah. So, so, so when he got so that he was retired, we put all of the farmland in CRP. Yes. At, at three different t t points in time. And most of the people here are going to know, but for the people who might be seeing this on on Channel Nine, can you explain what CRP? Hey guys, we want to thank you. Let's let's. Why don't you guys go sit down? Good job. Uh, CRP I uh, have 8.2 acres in CRP uh, tree uh, planting 
and the rest of it is ceded to uh, grasslands for uh, protection of uh, land and to uh, revitalize it to some extent. Yeah. Crop reserve program is what it's Crop it's reserve right. program is what CRP uh, stands for. But my husband was very into trees, and so we made sure that we planted uh, one portion of our land to trees. And what, and what kind of trees mostly are they overseeing? Oh, uh, the forester from here in, Jer in Jefferson County selected them and... Was, was it Mr. Plum back in the day or was it... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay, that's right. Now near the creek, near, the, near Cedar Creek. Yes, and there are hickory and all other kinds. We have swamp hickory that grew there uh, naturally. Swamp hickory has a nut that's the size of a wall, of a uh, large walnut. Yes. Uh, they only grow along Cedar Creek, as far as I know. Back in 1835, the uh, the army sent they called them the dragoons, the expeditionary force. They're trying to figure out Iowa wasn't a state until 1846, <laughs> and they were trying to figure out places to put forts, but also to see where people could live, and they were. They made a catalog of all the trees they found, and also all the fish and everything else. And it was astonishing the variety of trees that would grow right here in Jefferson County. They viewed the land really between uh, the Des Moines River and the Skunk River as a remarkable, they called it a paradise because of everything that grew here. When they came through, it was summer, it was early summer in June. They noticed that their wagon wheels were red, and at first they had a little bit of alarm, and they saw they had they were running over wild strawberries. And of course, they stopped and had a good old picnic because it was amazing uh, in this part of the of what became the state of Iowa. And they, they realized it was incredibly rich, and they were impressed with the variety of, of uh, trees that were here. So that's good. Well, then the um, the CRP program then if you you've kept on. Mm -hmm. And is all your land given given over to it now? Uh, yeah, all of our farmable land is uh, in the CRP program. Sure. All that was farmable. That's great. I think we had like a hundred out of a hundred two hundred and thirty six acres originally. I think we had like a hundred and twenty five or a hundred and thirty that were considered farmable. Right. The rest was all pasture and mm -hmm. Cedar Creek bottom and mm -hmm. and Timber. trees and Timbers. a variety. Okay. Berries, lots of berries. Back in those days, I don't. Raspberries and blackberries. Great. And gooseberries. When I mow oh, in the, in the early eat. summer, it's just I just eat while I'm mowing. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's an extra incentive. Do you have memories of being out in the in the trees or the berries from growing? Oh yeah, we used to spend a lot of time. My sister and my brother and I, uh, my both my sisters. Sorry, we used. To, <laughs> go out and pick gooseberries and raspberries and blackberries. We had red ones and black ones and mulberries. We, we picked one apple tree when we were little. Yeah, we had one apple tree that we always climbed a lot. We had an orchard that we had plums and um, plums and apples and peaches and apricots. My dad never met a tree he didn't like. <laughs> we, well, he, um, it, he found it very difficult to cut down a tree. In fact, if he came to my house, I live in a tumble, but if he came to my house and found a tree had taken root, I'd want to take it out of my flower bed or whatever. He'd be like, oh, no, we're going to dig that up. You know, plant it. <laughs> All right. He always yeah. wanted a tree. And then he, was, he also liked us to take care of trees, not to just automatically cut them down. And he was very particular about if he, he let somebody need to cut wood, what tree could be cut down or cut up. Mm -hmm. Good for him. Well, it was not the vision of everyone who came to the county initially. If a tree was there, good, I'll cut it down. A place like Perlee, for example, had enough trees to build 400 houses. Did that, but didn't plant anything else. Mm. And so we know Perlee now is, we see it on signs, and we know it from towns of yesteryear that really aren't there anymore. So, has Well, he, he yeah. would log it, but he, he was very particular about what could be taken. Hmm. Well, Tell him about all the sticks sticking up uh, in the yard <laughs> so he couldn't mow. Yeah, we had to have a stick around every tree that was possibly coming up about where we could mow. <laughs> so it was very difficult. And we had a lot, we have a large yard. 
So there was a lot of things to mow around and weed eat around. <laughs> and if he'd eat a peach off the tree, he'd bury that seed yeah, he'd, anywhere. He'd heal, he always called it, he, he'll, he'd heal it in. And it wouldn't be long before it'd be growing. Johnny Appleseed, good for more than apples. <laughs> really, that's great. That's great. Well, I know that there must be other memories that people have, and I, we're only too happy to hear them about. Tell them about up. ice skating. Somebody oh, needs she wants to wants us to tell about ice skating. So when we were kids, yeah. so we lived on Cedar Creek, but it it had been changed. The route of it had been changed at one time, and so be, long before I ever lived there, I'm not sure the when 30s. it happened. Yeah. It happened in the 30s. They changed the route yeah. of it. Well, when they changed the route, it left what we always called the bayou, which was just like a little section of it. It came off, I don't know how many yards long it was, but it was never very deep. In fact, when we were kids, we used to hand fish it. Remember hand fishing at Lois? And because you could stand in it and it would not even be like to your thighs. And we were like, I don't know, seven or eight years old. <laughs> we were, yeah, we'd pit, feed them to the pigs. We'd get so many fish wow. that we couldn't eat. But that, that always froze really solid in the wintertime. And my dad, well, he had osteomyelitis, so he was never able to, to ice skate. But he always wanted us to learn. So, And his brothers would come down and ice skate with us. And, and uh, we have a reason to start from the underbrush on fire. Yeah, he'd, fire he'd have a chance to clean out some of the underbrush. And, <laughs> uh We'd always have hot dogs and marshmallows. I, I, I'd stay up at the house, and when they got back, then I'd have hot chocolate ready for them. Yep. And, and sometimes he'd go down the snow shovel and scoop it off. And we'd yeah, the sometimes we'd have to have this shovel the ice off. off. Yeah. We had a pond, but it was too deep. It would never freeze solid enough for us to skate on, but we always could skate on the bayou. No, you know, now with the bayou, yeah. what we still we still ride, ride our four-wheelers a lot on, on the ice when it's thick enough and it's been cold enough and recently we when it drains it dries up in the summertime mm -hmm. we go four-wheeling on it a lot and it's a lot on it's the dry kind of, it's kind of like the salt flats yep. just a smaller version of it all right <laughs> wheelies get <laughs> okay that's good it's certainly true that in the 1930s uh there was an effort uh army corps of engineers uh did, they were tiling the rivers they tiled skunk river then too and they tiled you know the, the creeks like cedar creek to stop them natural meandering and to make it more easier on the farmers who had parcels that were that had boundaries and they wanted to be able to farm it all. There's a plus and a minus environmentally to that. We realized that price is paid in stopping what nature would do by itself and it tends to, to, to kind of dig down a lot deeper. Have you noticed it's that? It's a lot deeper, yeah. yeah. Okay, and I've, so. I've, I've thought about rerouting re, re it the old way it was. I think that would be more well, and when we were kids, we, we had a lot of cows. And so we spent a lot of time, my sister and my brother, I don't know if my little sister did it so much, but we had a lot of checking fence and making sure the cows didn't get out. And we had to have a water gap across the creek so they wouldn't cross over into the neighbors. But uh, we spent every time there, the water got high, we had to go down and fix the water gap. <laughs> Nothing we liked better than hearing we had to fix the water gap on Saturday. Because <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time fixing water gaps. What's a water gap? So it's like a fence that goes across the creek. But so and the creek was like where our water gap was. I'm not sure how many feet down it was. It's probably all the way to the ceiling. It's probably like as high the as the ceiling. The, top of the yeah. bank. We'd have but to, it would flood all that way. Yeah, it'd flood all the way to the top. And, and then it, it, the it, would, it would wash the fence out, and then they'd have to go back and, and, and refix it when the water went down. You've seen Cedar Creek out, I'm sure. Yeah. That's. On YouTube, you can uh, see a film called Cedar Creek. It's only seven minutes long. And it's produced by the, uh, Dick DeAngelis, who's the, the director of all these Fairfield history films. Hmm. And it's actually won some awards, but it's about the same creek. Hmm. And it is, in fact, you're quite right, uh, what's happening uh, in a lot of places. Some people are wishing that they could take it back to the old days, get rid of the tiling, uh, so to let the meandering happen on its own so that the flooding is not going to be so severe because of that deep V into the, into the ground that's been kind of dug out by having it tiled in that way. Well, one thing that we, I didn't mention, but Ryan's whole family has been, they're kayakers. I think his boys have kayaked since they were like three years old or maybe yeah. even littler. Right. They've owned ca kayaks, and, but I don't think they've always been able to kayak it because it's, it gets so low and yeah ours it gets pretty low up where we're at we go south of fairfield where it's a lot bigger and, and it's a more natural 
it meanders a lot more because they it's a lot rockier, so yep. they couldn't they dig couldn't it and straighten it. it as good. Yeah. Okay. Where we're at is all mud and dirt, so it was easy to straighten. As far as that old childhood memory, then the least favorite words are. <laughs> we have to walk the fence and fix the water gap. <laughs> All right. That was not the greatest way to spend your Saturday. <laughs> but when you when we went out to walk fence, and I went with you lots of times too, you guys got to ride the riding tree and the riding cow. We had a cow that we rode. <laughs> we had more than one. Izzy Izzy was one. She had an eye on her neck, and she'd basically just stand there until we got on, and then we. would and she'd just walk real slow. She was a really good cow. <laughs> How old were you when that? I don't know. She's a cow girl. We were in elementary school, probably. You remember when we were trying to move in red pig? Oh, yeah. Well, we. You, we, your we got rubbed off and Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had, a, we had a pig lot that was around the. But we thought it was a good idea to ride the pigs. It was not such a great idea. <laughs> but <laughs> he, you, he, he, your the your pig brother was, and his well, cousin did. My brother was better at it, but. Uh, the pig was smart enough to run up and push us against the side of the barn to, <laughs> to throw us off. <laughs> but we also spent, well, back in those days, we had a we had a, a, a farrowing house, and so my brother and I's job was to ring the pig's nose, and we had a hand ringer. I'm surprised we still don't have that tool because it was it was ancient. I'm not sure how, where we got I it. I think but it's in the old medicine cabinet. I don't know how many times I've been bit on the thigh by a pig. <laughs> Didn't want to be in the ringed. That, that's where it used we used to be kept in the old medicine cabinet. <laughs> I don't I've been know bit why. many times in the thigh by a pig. <laughs> Can you remind me again what generation you are from people who uh, settled the land? What generation are you, Ryan? The littlest, uh, the four boys that were up here, they would be eighth generation. Eighth generation. And there's three brothers who came from Ohio. Uh, did they come, were they single men at the time, or did they come with families, or? We're not, a, I have no history that tells me that. Have they been our grandfather? Grandfather? Great. There. Great so, family. the people that came were Daniel Townsend, which is uh, my great, great grandpa. And then his son, Alan, was the one that built our house in 1904. And then his son, Guy, was my grandpa. And then his son, Carol, was her husband. And Your then, dad. And then my dad. And then his son was Frederick. And his, and his son is, is Ryan. And he had another son, Clint. Yeah, his dad. And the, these Fred are the grandsons. Roscoe and, and uh, Arlo are his grandsons. Or his so sons. If we're counting backwards then from these guys, how many great, great, great are we talking about? <laughs> I don't know. If it's eight, I don't know. <laughs> I think it's at least three. I think it's I at least four. three. So your family's been here a long time, guys. You're part of a, a great tradition. It's good to know. Back way back in say the nineteen thirties when you know you spoke about being there. It was a hard time for the state of Iowa. We know that there were years with no crops at all because of the chinch bugs. Is there any memory of the chinch bugs that, that was during the Dust Bowl for the rest of the country? Chinch bugs really stopped an entire year's harvest uh, in the early 1930s here and took a half half of the harvest away two other summers. Um, I don't there? remember my husband ever mentioning anything about hardship with uh, Crops. Uh, he mentioned the the weather being so terribly hot in '34 and '36, I think. And he was born in the in the farmhouse that we live in. Okay. And he had lived there four different times in his life. Wow. So it was it was really a home yes. to him. Well, it wasn't all... He, he was born there in uh, December 17th of 1923. And he lived 89 years, two months short of, or two weeks short two of... Two weeks his, short of 90. Uh, 90. And I made it, to, I'm two weeks from 92, so... <laughs> We're glad that you're here to tell the story. I, you know, there are a lot of times where people wish they had asked questions 
Are there any questions from the family for somebody who's 92 years old and has been part of it or any of the other others? Because it, it sometimes helps us remember a little more about ourselves to, to find out. I've certainly been asking a lot of questions. Um, what was the hardest? You know, you mentioned the 1934 and 1936 summers. What about hardest winters? We know we're not, uh, <laughs> yeah, we've had some. Everybody's had them. Who, uh, do any stand out? 78. Yes. 78, the, That's often the snow was so high. It was, we had a Volkswagen uh, van, and it was probably at least another six or seven feet taller than that, wouldn't you say, Lois? Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. And while well, we came to town that, that winter, at Christmas time, my sister Lois lived in town here yeah, with her then husband, and we were snowed in. We couldn't get home. And then school was canceled for two weeks here. I was in band at that time, and we were supposed to go to Florida for a trip in the summertime, and we went to school all the way up until that trip when we were supposed to have two weeks off beforehand. Because <laughs> we had to make up so many days. Plus, we went Saturdays. Wow. Back in 79. That was the year I graduated. Yeah. I was in the Quad Cities then. And it was bad. It was a bad winter. Mm -hmm. anyway. But also when we were kids, mm -hmm. so we lived there. The first summer we lived there was 67. And then that winter, I'm not sure when we got electric heat because we always just had a coal furnace. We got electric heat in 1970. We had, we so made, like the first the three place years, all electric we had coal heat. And there was one register in the center of the house and there went up to the top floor and that was there was only one room in each basically level that had the register the heater, yeah yeah <laughs> we'd go sit on the register in the morning when we were well i was in kindergarten then so fred would have been in first grade lois would have been in second or third grade also one year didn't i move the bunk beds downstairs yeah we slept downstairs and, and one bought you each uh, an electric blanket yeah we used to call those octopus uh, yeah. Is that right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. It, it was all, all wood. It wasn't, and then lined with tin, wood ducts lined with tin. Mm. Kind of, I don't know how that didn't catch fire, but you know, it made it look like that. But then they put the electric heat heating on the floorboards in the RE, 1970s. REC guaranteed that our, our electricity would not cost us more than $300 for the winter if we put in electric heat. And they also our, insulated our, the house. They insulated yeah. the house with that paper blown in insulation. They were there. Uh, REC did that back in those days in 1970s. And then we spent, they put holes like up and down. Not, we had, we had to fix all the holes that they put in the walls. Yeah, they, yeah, they had, they, they kept holes about that big around in uh, three different places in the walls, in the plaster and blew in the insulation from the inside of the house because there was already aluminum siding on the outside, uh, which had been put on there fairly recently. And I remember we had to save the little circles so we could put them back in the spot mm -hmm. and then do the spackling over them because it was, I mean, it's not like your drywall. There was, there's not really any drywall in that house, <laughs> except uh, maybe in some of the ceilings that have been replaced, but. I misquoted about the price of the Heating. I think I, it was three something, but it must have been three thousand. It couldn't have been three hundred for the whole year. For the whole for the whole year. I'm not sure, <laughs> but anyway, it was supposed to be. It savings. was so wonderful. Baseboard heat, ceiling heat in any any room that that had water. So the bathroom, the laundry, kitchen, uh, the kitchen, uh, all had uh, ceiling heaters and uh, the rest of the house had baseboard heaters. And there was a thermostat in each room. Each room could be regulated accordingly. And the reason we went to all electric was because when we had a house in town, we had one of these big gas tanks, 500 or 1,000 gallon. And when we moved to the farm, they said they wouldn't move our gas tank unless we heated with gas. And I didn't intend to have a gas furnace. We already we had the coal furnace at that time and that was all we could afford to to run. 
And but I had a gas washer, I had a gas stove, I had a gas water heater, but that wasn't enough for him to move our gas tank to the farm. So therefore, as soon as each one of those things wore out, we went to electric. I bought my first <coughs> microwave way back when Amana first came out with Pickens mm -hmm. store here in Fairfield. It was when Trisha was born in 71, wasn't it? We heated up her baby bottles in it. <laughs> <laughs> I did one of my first, I did a 4-H project with it with one of my, one of our neighbor kids. We taught him how to make scrambled eggs in the microwave. It was quite the thing. Was, not everybody had a microwave. We <laughs> took our, we <laughs> took our microwave to the Jefferson bottle. County Fair. Yep. And demonstrated yeah, de how to I did use a the microwave. We did a demonstration on how to use the microwave at the Jefferson County Fair. Yeah, I was pretty Yeah, Just Lois did it too. Our, one of our sponsors for this entire series is uh, Farm Bureau, and we're grateful. Uh, and it looked like they were sharing the advanced technology as soon as it came out, trying to get it. And of course, it's getting loyal customers too. Amanda, with sorry, I, I imagine, but it, it did sound uh, a lot of convenience added to a life that might have not had it before. And I have to ask, there's up in the display case, there's a white enameled large pail. Um, it has a handle on it. Yes, it has a handle on it, which is, I'm sure, was a good thing, too. Do you mind talking about it? It's something that sometimes people are a little squeamish to, to say, but once upon a time, everybody had them. What well, was it? It's, it's called a chamber bot, and we... I used it when we were first married in 1957. We lived in a, on a, a rental farm south of Fair, Batavia. And we used it then because we had an outhouse. And we also used it again when we moved to the farm in 1967 67. because the farm had one faucet downstairs, one, one place to get wa running water and th we had an outhouse and I don't I think we put in plumbing pretty quickly I think you started that first summer when we were there. yes uh, her brother his dad and we we learned from a guy in Atama how to sweat copper pipes and we his brother was probably how old? Oh, probably my, my eight, brother was probably or seven or eight. He, yep. Yeah, his yeah his dad was probably seven or eight years old, and he learned how to sweat every kind of uh, joint there was on copper pipes. And my dad's brother Arlo, that lived in Batavia, he used to come out and help us too, because he did a lot of uh, repairing of appliances and things. That was his. Yeah, he he was associated with with uh, the daily. Hardware in Batavia, and uh, Daly was a cousin to my husband, and his son, Donnie Daly, farmed our land from the time we purchased it to the time he retired. We always open up questions for people who aren't in the family as well. Is there anyone? We've had a couple, but we want to invite people who are here listening. What was Batavia like? <coughs> 50 years ago? Uh, when I moved there in 57, we had two large grocery stores, a uh, pool hall, uh, two hardware stores. Uh, laundromat? A laundromat downstairs, a uh, beauty, beauty shop. shop. Uh, a, the hardware store was associated with the gas company, the one that I bought that gas tank from. <laughs> <laughs> There was Creek Oil Company. They're also mm -hmm. cousins of our family. There were uh, a funeral home. Uh, uh, let's see. There was there was a restaurant where uh, there were two or three restaurants. A locker plant. Yeah. A, a library. The library still there. The post office. Post the office. city hall. There was a city hall there, wasn't it there? Right there on the corner, next yeah. to the hardware store. Did you have a bank? Uh, the bank had already le left okay. at that time. Uh, they didn't have a bank in town because we always. Did you pay for their own? 
<laughs> they had a newspaper, the Batavia Beacon. Yeah, they had a newspaper. That was there a long and the, time. Well, they were associated with the Eldon Forum, too, so it was the Batavia Beacon. Well, they... Mom, didn't you? Mom, what? Didn't you write articles for Mom? I wrote articles for the, uh, the Eldon Forum after Eldon Forum bought out the Batavia Beacon. She was a school teacher in the, in the area, I, too. Yeah, I taught at Cardinal 30. for 38 years. Okay, what subjects? Uh, anything from... Well, I had homeroom, fifth grade, sixth grade, uh, but... Uh, in Batavia, you taught I, I third taught grade. at Batavia from 60 to 65, at Eldon from 65 to 75, at Agency from 75 to 90, and they, then I subbed at the high school from 90 to 98. <laughs> and all of those were part of Cardinal at one time, uh, or still are. Okay. But the schools have been... And I also teach at Cardinal. Now she okay. teaches at Cardinal. That's great. In what area? Uh, now I work in um, the alternative setting, but okay. I've done a lot of grades. <laughs> Now, Mostly high school. You came to high school at Fairfield. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when did the busing begin? You uh, rode the bus. We always rode the bus. Okay. I mean, I rode the bus in 1967. <laughs> Was it you guys that had a pet pigeon? Yes, oh, I had a pet cool pigeon. Bus. Tell that story. <laughs> yeah, I remember that story. I, I had, had a, a pet pigeon, money. Inky. We found Inky sitting on the sidewalk and one morning, and, and we took her in. She had kind of a hurt wing. She was a little, she was... So Not necessarily feathers. a baby, but she wasn't full grown. Pin feathers, she had pin feathers, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we, we nursed her and... and uh, her uh, bread crust soaked her mouth. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And we used to... And she we had like an old summer house that was outside our... We used to... The kitchen used to not be attached to the house. We had like an old summer house, but it was, became more of a shed as we got older. But it would, it would sit up there in the rafters. But mm -hmm. when we'd get on the bus in the morning, a lot of times... Inky'd fly with us, <laughs> so we'd have to go back and put her put her on the mailbox. <laughs> and she ate out of the cat's dish. Yeah, she ate out of the cat's <laughs> dish because that's where we fed the cats. Was in the summer old and summer. The cats house. didn't bother. Oh. Did you? You never met Inky? No. No. That was way before his time. It was like when I was in junior high, I think, wasn't yeah. it? Now, there were two schools that were mentioned upstairs on the display, and, and one is the Locust Grove School. Was it schoolhouse number seven? Seven? Yeah. Okay. Seven. And then? It's just about a mile from our farm. Okay, and that was the one you mentioned. And I think they're called... That's where the, the desk came from. Yep. Yeah, I, I think they're called uh, that number by what, uh, what section they're in. Yes, and I'm not sure how that works. Well, the surveyors who actually surveyed the county back in the late 30s and early 40s, that's the 1830s and 40s, uh, were obligated through the government direction to have 99 schools set up, a place for them at least, and almost all of them ended up being set up here in Jefferson County. And sometimes, you're right, there'd be several in a township, seven, and they sometimes had names. And other times they just had a number, that, except for the kids who went there and the families who sent them. There was no name, it was just a number. So it is amazing. If people have been to the uh, county fairgrounds, if, has anyone been there to see the replica to, of the school schoolhouse yeah. there? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what it was like. Um, they've done a real uh, honest job of trying to re you know, replicate what was there, and they've used a lot of materials gathered from these former schools that are no longer in operation. So the other school that w that you mentioned was the uh, was the Tavia Town School. Yes. And there's a picture in the display of of uh, a class at Batavia and who's school in and his my husband's dad's sister is in that picture. Okay. So her name so was, his, was so my, my was, dad's aunt. Got it. Yeah, was it was it Garney or was. was it Bernie? I don't remember. I don't remember. But all of his sisters. He had graduated. four sisters. Okay. Uh, Guy had four sisters, and they and he was the only boy, so he <laughs> didn't inherit the farm. The four girls inherited the farm because he couldn't. He was. The only one I think that was married at the time, 
and he couldn't afford to uh, do it. So he, he moved off at one time. My husband lived there four different times. He was born there, and then he came back and stayed and went to grade school. I, he might have been there that long during the early 30s. And I think his dad had to give it up probably about 38. He went and worked somewhere at a farm in Minnesota for a while, and then he came back to Iowa. And my husband, Carol, had to go to Iowa City. From the time he was five years old till he was 17, he had to go to Iowa City for care of his leg. And uh, so he lived for uh, he, he lived for a couple of years in Cedar Rapids with his grandparents. And I'm not sure which grandparents those were. That would have been probably Alan Reed. Yeah. Uh, Devore, that lived, and I don't know what he did there, but I, we went there to look at the pictures of, I think it was Franklin School in Cedar Rapids, and it showed, it, and he had a picture, and a class picture there, or like third grade or something like that, and he went there. His, his Aunt Gertie, uh, which was his dad's sister, uh, took him back and forth on the inner urban from Cedar Rapids to Iowa City for these visits to the university hospital. Uh, when he lived in Iowa, or I'm not, when he lived down here, the, they used to have a university uh, car that would come around and get the children that needed to go to the hos children's hospital in Iowa City for care for their appointments. But didn't Daddy break his leg when he was? No, he didn't break his. He had some kind of injury. I think it was kicked by a cow or something like that, and his his bone wouldn't heal, and it turned into osteomyelitis. And they told him any time he would get a bone injury, it would. Uh, come back, but and it it did when he had surgery in '82 on his knee, and he was sent home from the hospital after about three days, and the osteo came back. He had to go back to Iowa City to have the osteo treated. People don't have it anymore because of antibiotics. And yes, antibiotics were developed during the Second World War, and he was in the hospital in Iowa City when uh, the war broke out. A World War. Two uh, would have been 1941, uh, and his doctor was Japanese, and his doctor disappeared. Of course, was probably like they had they put all the Japanese in in camps because they didn't know who they could trust and who they couldn't, and so his doctor disappeared, and they left his cast on his leg uh, so, so long that the stitches were draining and it left oh, holes in the side of his femur, his upper leg. And uh, that was the reason he, it didn't Well, he grew, because, he grew during that time too. Yeah, right? during, he would have been growing during that time. Because he was, he ended up being about six six one, but yeah. he was not that tall on that but other his, side. That's why his leg was shorter than the other. He people. wore a boot with a big, like a block of wood, about four it, six it, inches. They made it out of cork. When we, were, we he used to, we used to go to yeah. Uh, the, we used to go uh, to Fort Madison Fort Penitentiary. Madison, the, they used to have a a cobbler a cobbler at the prison. Uh, a lot of people didn't even know, and he didn't like me. Considered handicapped at all. <laughs> he chased cows. He worked at a factory. <laughs> well, he didn't like green tractors. And the reason earlier. the reason was because he applied for work at John Deere when he came back from California. He worked in California during the war because <clears throat> they wouldn't take him in the service. Because he they wouldn't, yeah, and because of his leg and. Uh, 
So he worked he, in an ammunition plant. He, he uh, tried to uh, sign on at, at Deer, and Deer wouldn't hire him, and Not Dexter would. Okay. So he worked for Dexter for 38 years. Mm -hmm. A related story on him not liking John Deere. I heard from him that he didn't like Ford because he bought a brand new Ford and 20,000 miles later the engine blew up and uh, they wouldn't help him out on it. Mom had a Chevy. When they got married, Mom had a brand new Chevy. Uh, 57, 57 Chevy, Chevy and he had a 57 and he Ford had a 57 Fairlane. Ford Fairlane. Hers lasted until, I don't know, I, was, I remember it. So I, I bought the Volkswagen, bought Volkswagen and, and uh, 67 65. or 5, yeah. 65. Those are icons. The 57 <laughs> Chevy, if you ever had one. Got any pictures? Yes. Put it up I there. I think so. 57 Chevy is the way I to go. I, I, I think we have a picture I have one with my way. mother and dad by the Chevy. Yeah, got to see it. Somewhere. <laughs> this has just been great. We want to thank you. We're, we're limited to a, uh, an hour. We want to thank the whole Devore family. It's just been great.